And welcome into the All-22 as we get set for the Blue Devils to go on the road this weekend to take on Miami. David Shoemate, Dave Harding, and of course the talented wide receiver Jalen Calhoun. Primetime, right? We'll get to that a little <laughs> bit later on. But uh, appreciate you coming on. And th there's so much to talk about. We're going to look back at the weekend that was here in, in just a little bit. But I, I wanted to start, I don't think people realize what kind of career you're putting together and, and some of the milestones that you're on the verge of reaching you know, you're on the cusp, 185 yards away from in the top 10 on the all-time receiving list. Uh, you got a chance to be just the 11th Duke receiver uh, to have over 2,000 yards in your career. You've got like just shy of 1,900 right now. And 170 career receptions is seventh most all-time. You only need 20 to enter the top five. Is it crazy to you to, to look at all these historical numbers and, and realize the career you're putting together? You know, it's crazy because this is my first time hearing about this. So, um... It's definitely cool to hear about, you know, and it just made me really want to go work harder. Um, and really, I respect my game enough to, you know, where I put in enough work for me to reach these goals and different stuff like that. So very appreciative and just want to keep working. It does seem like this season in particular, you've emerged as a top receiving threat in the conference. And obviously those numbers help back it up and where you stack and in terms of, all-time numbers, but Coach Elko earlier in the week mentioned a conversation that he had with you going into the year um, where basically he wanted to feel out what your aspirations were. Was the, the NFL kind of in, in your sights? And he said, based off of that conversation, he got a feeling that you were about to get to work and, and to really open things up. Did you feel a difference when, when Coach, after that conversation and, and having a a sense of who the new coaching staff was going to be, that you had an opportunity to really ramp things up and to, to take a next step in your competition? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Um, and the main word he used was consistency for me. Um, and honestly, after that conversation, like, I just got focused. Like, I, I locked in more on what I actually had to do to have all the intangibles of a receiver of what the NFL teams want in a receiver. Um, so, you know, I went back, looked over my game, um, sat down with Coach Zion, and, you know, we reviewed some stuff. And after that, like, it just clicked from there, you know. And then with that conversation with Coach Elko, I was already, you know, I was already think I was going to be the leader of the rec receiver room. Um, so bring them, them guys along with me too, you know. Um, so just putting everything together, you know, for me to be the best player I am. You mentioned Zion Burton. I want to talk about the re receiving room because it feels like you've obviously – had a good season, but it feels like everyone's taken a jump, whether it be Samir, whether it be Elon. I mean, you can go down the list. We've seen Malik the last few weeks making plays. How has this clicked so quickly? Because w when you look at teams across the country that have gone through coaching changes and new staffs coming in, it hasn't gone smooth in, in some places, but it feels like for you guys, it, it clicked pretty much from the jump. How did it come together so quickly? The players, you know, we, when we all got together and we knew this was going to be our change, and this is going to be, you know, our culture, you know, we was like, we have to buy in to what these coaches are telling us to do, you know, what they want from us so we can all get together and, and come as collective and we all win, which is the ultimate goal, you know. And, um, you know, especially for the receiver room, for us connecting with Coach Zion, um, it was really just him coming in and just, you know, you got to go to work, you know, every day. Every day you have to go to work, and you're not going to get better if you don't go to work. Um, so in that room, we push each other. Each and every one of us, we push each other to be the best we can be. Um, every game, we try to go out and be more physical than the other team. Um, and we show that, you know, we own that, you know, and we say that every game, every practice, that we have to own it as a receiving core. So I feel like that shows. When you say go to work, I, I, when I turn the tape on of you, I see you separating from defenders better this year than you have in the past. Um, you know that sticks out just when, when it when you look at our receiving core as a whole doing that better. Is that a matter of running the route better? You you just mentioned physicality. What goes into being able to create some of that separation down the field? That's to a guy that never caught a pass seems to be pretty pretty critical in having success in the passing game. It just you know just sitting down with Coach Zion, honestly, you know, and he's the puppet master behind that. Um, you know, we sit down and watch literally watch our routes. And our biggest thing is winning one on ones. 
every you know every practice every game our one on one is the biggest thing because you know we going we 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 pride ourselves in putting offense on our back and making plays when when it when our time comes um so you know like I said before watching film and watching how we ran our route before to now how he how he wants us to run it and then we looked at you know the options in between both of them and then we pushed the words over you know more Coz Zion's side because you know what he was telling us was working you know and and his stuff works so we kept with it. I mean how minute are these details like how specific is he getting is it your your foot needs to be here or when you get to the top of the route your hands need to be doing this I'm just curious like what what is the attention to detail when you're watching that tape to result in the difference that we've seen on the field you know it's not really a, a big change um honestly it's really more of us just moving the, moving whoever we want like where we want the defender to go that was our biggest thing just get him off his spot once we all learn how to do that to his standard that's when we start you know we start seeing the progress and then every day we just kept working at it and steadily working at it you know and every day it wasn't the same thing you know one day it might be hands working off, off hands getting off releases other days it might be footwork uh footwork type stuff releases um second level releases um so it's not really big things because we are a very talented group but the small minority things like you know re the release game actually how to run you know a 12 yard route when this man is inside leverage or outside leverage and stuff like that that's that's what he's teach preaching us you mentioned having the defender where you want them to be i'm certainly not quick enough i i can't imagine <laughs> what it's like but you know, you had one against Virginia. Samir had one against North Carolina on Saturday night. Those double moves where you have the inside fake and then you go out, you each get touchdowns out of it. Riley does a little shoulder shake. What is that moment like when you know I've got them to come inside and now I've got them over the top? You know, over, over, during the week, it's just you might mess up on it during the week. So <laughs> during the week, you know, you can yell that this is in the third. And then, you know, when it comes down to like around Thursday, you pretty much got it, you know, and then Saturday we, we or Friday we talk about it. And then Saturday when that time's come, you know, I got him where I want him. Like he's in that position, we seen on film. So now it's just run the first route first. Mm -hmm. That's the key to it, run the first route first, then the rest of it is going to take itself, take care of itself. You've established yourself as one of the better blockers on the team also. You, you mentioned physicality earlier. I'm curious, some of those blocks – kind of be get created on the fly because there'll be a pass to one of your teammates you're running a route and so you somehow like have a sixth sense about you to know that the ball has been thrown and now it's time for you to be engaged as a blocker how do you do that and also throwing in the element of a running quarterback when Riley's scrambling and then he decides okay I'm going to tuck and run you could be 20 30 yards down the field and have to switch your mindset immediately is that something that your coach to do or it just kind of has has worked out in in your favor i mean i i feel like every, every team is coached to do it but it's just really a want to at that point it's a want to if you want to block or not um and then it is an instinct too you know you don't get the ball right then it's like quick reaction but when you got to turn around you know find the next defender um and i love seeing big plays i love seeing explosive plays i love getting my teammates open and knowing i have a running quarterback I know he's going to get out the pocket, and I'm going to have to turn and go block somebody, you know, to create extra yards. And then we always talk about in our room extra efforts, extra efforts. Like, don't just play watch. You know, go get on somebody, you know. Go hit somebody every play. Like, that's what we preach, and that's going back to physicality in our room. The other thing it seems like has popped off the stat sheet, at least for you guys this year in the receiving room, is the yards after catch. How much of that is – plays you guys are making, how much of that is the ball that Riley's throwing that he's leading you guys into space where you're able to do that? Because it feels like that's one of, been one of the bigger differences in the offense. You guys aren't just getting a seven-yard pass play or an eight-yard pass play. You're turning it into a 30-yard play. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, Riley is definitely putting the ball in the right spot, and that plays a big, big part in that. Um, but then after that, like we just preach, you know, it's God-given talent. You know, just go do what you go do um, when the ball is in your hands, you know. Um, and then we want to get as many yards as we can. So <laughs> just run. Get greedy. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, the other thing I was curious is, like, the chemistry. Obviously, you were a quarterback. We've talked about that before back in high school. We talked about route running and everything. I don't want to give you give away secrets and stuff like that. But you got a sophomore quarterback. You're a very experienced guy. 
You guys seem to have a knack, though, across the receiver room, but you in particular, when the initial play breaks down and it becomes just backyard football and you're trying to find a space for Riley to throw to, how does that work from a communication standpoint? Because it's not like you guys have known exactly, okay, well, if, if this all breaks down, I'm going to cut left and does that zag right? Like, how do you guys work that out when you're down the field just trying to make something happen when the play's broken down? It's just, it's like I said about blocking instinct, you know, honestly, and it's basically just playing backyard football because at first the play didn't work, it broke down or whatever happened in the backfield. Now we got to make a play for our quarterback and get open for him. You know, because it might be a defender running to him, and then we on that same sideline. You know, we got to come back to the ball some way, somehow, however. Um, so, yeah, we, we preach that. And then, like I said, it's just instinct. Do I those mean, points actually work? You'll see a quarterback, like, point. Um, in the pros, they do it all the time. Oh, yeah, they, do, What are they, they pointing it's at? Like, like, it's just a direction. <laughs> just go that way. Just go that way. Go upfield. <laughs> you know? Um, and we might be going that way, but then you might feel the defender, like, around you, you know, um, so sometimes you might have to go upfield, sometimes you might be go down uh, across the field, you know. So him point actually helps too, but then again, it's also feeling where that where your defender is at too. This group seems to be selfless. Sometimes in a wide receiver room, you get the the diva, the guy that wants to be the the guy and gets upset if he's not. Um, when it comes to the route combinations, it seems like there are, are designed routes to take attention from a defense to get somebody else open. David was talking about that, those double move looks, but I've seen you run routes underneath, kind of clearing out defenders, making it difficult for them to work over the top for another one of your teammates mm -hmm. in some of these crossing patterns. Are those routes where you've predetermined you're not getting the ball, you're trying to take, take somebody's eyes, take a defender's eyes? Um, or does it just kind of work out as the play is developing? Every route, every route you could possibly get the ball. Yeah. You, you can never know, you know, what happened uh, during the play. So just run your route full speed every play. Um, but sometimes, you know, certain plays that are caught in the game, you know, you're probably not going to get the ball. Like, you know, you might have like a, a dummy fly route, you know, but you got to run that to your to full speed to go get another teammate open, you know, and that's just going back to the selfishness. Yeah, that's I've seen the, the effort you talk about right. the the blocking is kind of a want to thing. Right. That effort has shown up on tape to me when you, when you know you're not getting the ball, but you're still running that fly route and it's pulling a safety over just enough to open up the middle of the field. That that want to is there. It's pretty cool. Right. Feels like everyone we've talked to has brought up David Feely and Coach Elko's talked about this. Uh, throughout the season. Normally when you think about physicality, you think about defense, right? But it, it feels like offensively you guys have decided physicality is going to be your identity on offense. Yes, sir. When did that happen? When did that come together? Because you guys are kind of imposing your will. I mean, you looked this past weekend almost 300 yards rushing. Ten months ago in January when we first met Coach, Coach um, Elko and Coach Feely, uh, that's where all everything started, our culture, our physicality. You know, what we wanted to do and where we wanted this team to go all started 10 months ago. Um, started in the weight room. You know, and we knew we had to be – we had to get stronger. We had to get bigger. We had to get faster. We knew that. So when we bought in the Coach Philly system, you know, that just and, – and we see the progress in it over spring and then in the camp and then now into the season. You know, we're so bought in now that, like, we know we can do this and we know we're going to be more phys physical than the other team. It was clear the team was hungry for, for that extra work that Coach Feely put in. Past the midweight point of the season now, looking at the, the rest of the season that, that is yet to be played, how hungry is this group? And some people have said, oh, it's great to see Duke out there fighting. You know, they got an ACC win, kept it close against North Carolina. I get the sense that that's not something you guys are satisfied with. Can you give us an idea of the tone in the locker room or the, the feel as you're moving into the latter part of the year? Oh, yeah, it's one word that just came into mind when you said it, and that's starving. Mm. No, we're starving. Yeah, not hungry, starving. No, we're yeah. starving. Like we we want to go get it. We are going to go get it. Um, this team is not going to quit. And like I said, each week we're going to keep chopping wood. That's what we keep. That's what we preach. Keep doing that. Love it. All right. Well, 
We're going to get to the highly rated portion of the program here in a second. We'll play the password <laughs> game. This is where Dave starts to get nervous. <laughs> where I'm looking for the door. Before we get to that, <laughs> do want to get through some rapid fire stuff with you. And I'm, I'm going to date myself. We were talking about this before we got on. First question is, what's the best game day fit? Do, do I even have that right? Is that, is that the best way to describe it? For sure. I mean, you could say drip, too, but I, I give you fit. What did you Shoot call me, it? I'm shocked you even knew what fit. Way I, back in 2013, I, I, what did you call it? I'm, I know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in my day, it was, I don't even know, uh, garb? <laughs> <Out 'cause, laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. I saw you down on the field before the game against Carolina. It was pretty sweet. So I don't know if you want to nominate yourself, but, but who would you say has the best game day fit? Because you guys got those blazers now. You know, I would nominate myself. <laughs> okay, <but> that's fine. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Oh, wow. Talk <laughs> well, about uh, selflessness. I probably, uh, I seen BJ. I seen BJ Vincent. Uh, BJ BJ Anthony. I seen him with. I, I want to say it was Virginia game. Maybe he had um. He had like a Cam Newton swag to him. Like I've never seen before. Like that. Like from a college player. You know. Like with the like. He had the uh, hat. Yeah, he had hat on. With the feather in it or something. Like he like <laughs> the hat was red. Like up underneath. <laughs> You know, we blew, so I was like, you know, it was different. <laughs> it was just a different, like, different fit I'd never seen before. So it was really unique for him. So I, I get that name, best fit. Cam Newton had, like, the squirrel tail or something also, like, hanging off the side. Yeah, he I always had the accessories. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That. So that's, 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 that's what it was. You've got some drip on right now. The J5, is this your your uh, brand? What is yes, it? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. This, is, this is my brand. Uh, J5 Rockstar Collection owned by Dope Athletes. So. Pretty yes cool. Sir. Yeah, a little NIL opportunity, yes I'm sir, assuming. Yes uh, Sweet. Very cool. Um, how'd you get the nickname Primetime? You know, uh, my homeboys in school was calling me, like, they always thought I was a playmaker, different stuff. My favorite player was Deion Sanders. Um, so it just all fit together. So when I made my Twitter for the first time, Primetime Jalen was dead, and I stood with it. Cool. We might have kind of jumped the gun here because you talk about the NIL opportunity. Obviously, you're involved in that. If you're not doing football or schoolwork or stuff like that, what's your hobbies? Obviously, you're kind of an entrepreneur a little bit. Love making money, for sure. <laughs> Love making Favorite money. color, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Green. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, but honestly, I, I play the game. I play video games a lot. I play video games a lot. And yes, I'm the best gamer on the team. Well, best gamer. He just the said that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. We, we are getting ahead of ourselves. Um, what about when it comes to playing in a game, would you rather the weather be hot or cold? Hot. Be humid this weekend. Hot for sure. Hot. All hot. right. I'm from South Frank Carolina. the Heat. I'm yeah. from South Carolina. It's hot. <laughs> well, now we, we have jumped ahead. So you've established you're the best gamer on the team. I would be curious who's your most stiff competition, but also mm. what is your favorite video game right now? Mm. Comp. I'm trying to think who beat me on the team. Uh, the second question is Madden. Madden is my favorite okay. favorite game. Um. Uh, I love how we had humility. There's really with, no with competition. The fit, but when it came to the video games, it's like, you know. <laughs> yeah. I got to tell you that one. I have he, to, he has his limits. You know? uh, he knows he's going to hear about it, too. So I am a, you got to be strategic. I understand. This is like Darius yeah. talking about the basketball. Like, there really is no. I know. It's okay. You can say nobody. Nobody. The nobody's on your level. Nobody. Goodness. All right. You heard it here first, folks. Um, <laughs> how about your favorite football, as we move on quickly, <laughs> uh, favorite football memory since you've been at Duke? Honestly, my favorite memory is probably Virginia game. I'll tell you that about Temple game because that was our first game. With this, with this uh, program, uh, this staff, and we went out there, and we didn't play a perfect game by any means, but we went out there and fought, and we seen what we could do, and all the work that we put in, and to see, you know, my teammates all ecstatic and full of joy, and like looking forward to playing the season, and having a special season, that was probably my favorite moment. It, have, it doesn't have nothing to do with me making a play, you know doing anything with football, but seeing my teammates in this program in a different light, probably one of my favorite memories, really. Very well said. Uh, we're going on the road this weekend. Duke is going to be at Miami. Uh, I think for you, this will be the second time you played in an NFL venue because of the game against Alabama down in Atlanta early on in your career. But 
So that would be a piece of it, too, playing at NFL venue is always kind of cool. But for you, what, what's your favorite part of, of going on the road with Duke football? Definitely flying. Flying. You know, I don't really fly much. So Do you have uh, a go-to yeah. snack basket play? Say again. Do you have a go-to thing in the snack basket? That's what we worry about. <laughs> the them back. Yeah, the snack basket game is elevated this year. Definitely. I don't know if you've noticed. Yeah, you got the gummy bears. I knew you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Oh, you better be lucky that the snack baskets come from the front to the back because David Shoemate would wipe it out. <laughs> I do, I do. So if y'all don't get none, just come out. Uh, we'll come I find you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, you be careful because you have an angry David Shoemate coming for you. Um, what about your favorite part of, of Duke's campus, P favorite place to go? Would it be wrong to say while it's wait? I don't think so. No, that's the right answer. Right answer. Yeah. Well, this weight for sure. Coach Feely might be upset it's not the weight room, but uh <laughs> 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 Well when you're rolling in the stadium on game day, good pivot. What's on the pregame playlist? A lot is on the pregame playlist. Uh my go to song is probably hmm, Finito by Chief Keith or Love Sosa by Chief Keith. One of those two. It's just a song like one of the beats that like just come in, just like yeah, and it just gets you hyped from the start. Like you like, all right, I'm ready to go. I'm yes. in that mode. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's kind of got that South Florida vibe you know? too. Yeah, I, I know what so. you mean. Um, finally, best touchdown celebration on the team. Who's who's got it? I give it to Eli. Eli Pankle. I give it to Eli. I do have a follow-up question to that. Uh, in the college game, obviously, you can get flagged for having an egregious, you know, independent-type touchdown celebration. Is there conversation leading up to the season or at any point during the year where you, you guys say, look, here's what I want to do. I'm going to need some, some team participation so I don't get the flag. You know, what I'm going to say to that is, in the next five games, we'll see. Okay. Oh, it's a like tease. That slogan on football when you tackle and on defense, like rally to the football. Yes. Rally to the celebration. No, like, <laughs> no doubt. What's that, what's that uh, you know, like shows in, it's like to be continued? No, that's a tease. Yeah. You, you're tease. in showbiz. That's prime time right there uh, at, at work. It's that time. It is. Are you ready? This is far from prime time. <laughs> 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 password game. Two guys have gotten 10 out of 10. Yep. Dude, football seems to be the category to go with. But it's a blind draw. You're going to pick a number one through four to get your category, and then Harding's going to hook you up. We've gone over the rules. Ten minutes, ten answers, one word clues. Big moment here. Pick a number one through four. All right, Daryl, I'm betting on you. Three. All right, here we go. Here we go. What do you think it'll be, Harding? Uh, I feel this is going to be famous athletes. You got a shot. We College got football mascots. Okay. Uh, this makes me feel a little bit better. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, I'll give you a hint at the beginning. Okay. He's not always going to go college to try to give you the answer. So remember that as he starts giving you these okay. clues. That's a very, very good tip. You right got two minutes. You ready? Yes, sir. Many out of ten. Ready? Yep. All right. Jacksonville. It's a bird? Falcons? No, no. It, this is just a, any college football mascot. So – I'm go I'm giving you the clue Jacksonville. And listen, I think this is an important time to think about what Shoemate just said that this could the clue I give might not be college football. I'm just trying to lead you in a specific way. Also remember you can pass. Yes. Pass. All right. Uh Atlanta. Falcons. There we go. Yeah. There. Yep. <laughs> I hate you David. <laughs> David comes up with these. Um uh, <laughs> let's, I'm going to skip this one for a second. I, I hate this one, too. Um, I don't even know. Cincinnati. Bengals. No. Uh, uh, I've set us up for failure <laughs> by going. Uh, let's skip. Let's, let's skip. Okay, skip. Florida. Gators? Yes. Um, Ohio. Buckeyes? There we go. Arizona. Wildcats? Uh, the, uh, understandable. Um, um, this Sun is Sun Devils. 
Okay. <laughs> I, I have messed up. I have messed up. Yes, <laughs> yes, okay, yes. Okay. <laughs> I have royally messed this up. <laughs> um, Iowa. Hokey? Uh, uh, Hawkeyes? Okay. Skill. Okay. Yeah. Um, Washington. Redskins. No. Huskies. Yes. Good. Good. I messed up. Okay. Um, this is what I said. Jacksonville. Um, okay. I'm gonna uh, go with car. A car. Oh. A car. Jack. Just now that you've been through the round, Jacksonville. Jaguar? Yeah. Jaguar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I I am at a total loss for this. Thirty seconds. Um, a jacket. jacket. This is impossible. Um, uh, oh, you haven't given me one. I have skill. Pass. Uh, and then this one's also very hard. Um, gosh, I hate you. Man, uh, wait, we can count. get one more. I said Cincinnati. Can we try? Um, sure. Yeah. Team effort here? Yeah, here you go. All right. Since I wrote them. Uh, what was it? Uh, right, look at him. He's scrambling through all the cards. Tornado. No, I don't yeah. even I've seen it. I don't even oh, know. That one is hard. Yeah, no, these are hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> you got six, though. You did a good job. Hey, well done. Well done. Oh, you see what I was going? I was like Jacksonville. Like Jaguars was the the word. But like, who in college are the Jaguars? It's got to—I don't. South Alabama. Oh, uh, see, but I knew. And you, I he, knew that. Yeah. I knew that. But I, I, uh, okay. We're getting there. You got the Akron Zips. Zips. I should have said Akron, but would you have known Zips? Which one? Uh, I wouldn't Zips. know. Z I know where Akron is. Blue Raiders. So that's on you. That's what yeah, you just said. I should. I should have done that. Y'all yeah, know blue. Blue uh, Raiders. No, nah, that's not that Tennessee. Is. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's Tennessee uh, State. Murfreesboro. That's a lot of words. Murfreesboro would have been a, the the go to. Um, Cincinnati Bearcats uh, was one. Oh, NFL. But I messed you because you went Bengals. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. so because we kind of got on that weird in between, and then I said Iowa. It's the Cyclones mm. trying to get oh, you to pick to the Iowa next State, one. Though. Iowa State. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Zips, obviously. So you did a good job. You picked up Huskies, which was uh, Washington, uh, Cardinals, Jaguars, as we talked about before, the Gators down in Florida, Buckeyes, Falcons. There so should be like two categories. Pretty good. Like Duke football competitors and every other category. I mean, I think that's fair. It's really on the, the roll of the dice. I mean, what, what number would he have gotten for Duke football? You would have had to go with teammate four. number four. There you go. There you I go. think right. out of those, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not blaming him, my man right here. Oh, thank but you. <laughs> you I think, he said, he said, <laughs> but, but I think I already got at least eight out of ten. Oh, okay. oh. <laughs> no, right, right. Yeah, I, I should have said Akron. That, I messed that one up for sure. Okay. I'll right. take you. We can edit that butt out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah please. <laughs> Jalen, good luck this weekend. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Welcome back in. Our crew together, David Shumate, Dave Harding, and John Roth. As we look ahead to the game against Miami, we're going to talk about last week a little bit as well. But, guys, I want to start with the man we just heard from, Jalen Calhoun. And, you know, he's not one of the captains on this team, but he's clearly a leader, particularly in the receiving room. And if you want to look at why this team is so much better than they were a year ago, you got to start with the leaders, at, at least for me. And, John, to hear him talk and, and talk about how he's mentor guys and, and the science of the game and, you know, when we asked him what the best moment would be, I thought for sure it was going to be the, the throw at Virginia Tech on, on the option pass to, to Jackson. But, no, it was getting this program back where it needed to be. Just a fascinating conversation. I keep thinking back to his first touchdown. I think it was against North Carolina A&T his freshman year when uh, the guy grabbed his helmet as he was going in the middle of the field. He had to shake loose of the guy grabbing his helmet and got in the end zone, and he had a great little celebration. And uh, He's been, to me, uh, a very lively guy the whole time he's been here now in his fourth year. But yeah, you're right. And the thing that struck me from what he just said a few moments ago about uh, his teammates and everything was – uh, his kind of encapsulation of the attitude right now, which was starving. That was my favorite word out of the whole conversation. We talk about guys being hungry, wanting to do well, who wants it more. And clearly, he doesn't just want it more. I mean, he thinks this team is starving to get more. I thought that was great. Yeah, and I think 
that has shown and and pairing his ability I and mean, we saw him raw as a freshman out there working through people tugging on his helmet to get into the end zone to now having the the coaching and having years of experience under his belt being able to manipulate defenders down the field all of those things coming together with that that starving that hunger mindset and you're seeing a really good season and you're seeing a receiver that uh, I think is playing the best that he has with an opportunity to, to improve doing a great job of separating I mean, we saw the Duke offense struggled when he wasn't on the field against Georgia Tech and coach Elko will tell you I mean, he's a big reason for that feels like the last few weeks for Duke have been the ultimate glass half full glass half empty hypothetical how you want to look at getting your heart ripped out in <laughs> yeah. overtime in Atlanta and then certainly on Saturday night at home with look how far you've come that you know huge crowd great crowd the Duke crowd certainly turned out on Saturday night you're in there right to the end if one or two things go a certain way that didn't go a certain way you win the game and you get the victory bell back so how do you guys look at it? It feels like the team has certainly set their tone that they're not interested in moral victories. Uh, Mike Elko kind of said explicitly after the game, I don't want to get asked anymore about will this team respond. I mean, have you been watching for seven, eight games? We know they will respond. But, Dave, you've been in those positions. It is an emotional hurdle to get over these things. But it seems like they're doing it. How are they able to do it so well and move on? I think part of it goes to that hunger of – trying to win and you know if you let the game that you just played whether it's a victory or defeat linger it can beat you the next week and so in moving past that having a, a, an ability to have short-term memory and and just focus on the now the part of that grind acronym um, is the winning edge for this team you pair that hunger with the intense focus on what you've got to accomplish in any given week with the improved technique, the improved physicality of this team. That's where you see the, the, the fact that they're in this. I thought it was interesting to hear Coach Elko earlier. Um, you talk about the glass half full. I get f fixated on, you know, Duke two, two games in a row has the ball moving down the field with an opportunity to win the game and penalties take them out of scoring position, end up losing. Coach Elko says, well, okay, yeah, that is not incorrect, but how about the fact that in three of the, the losses this year, it's looked like Duke's been put on ice at one point where you could pretty much, like if you're a fan, pack up, start, start leaving the stadium, and – they find a way to get back in it. The, the fact that they've had opportunities to win, I know if your heart's getting ripped out, without a doubt. Um, but that, that shows, even within the course of a game, this team has that characteristic of not lingering on what's happened. They, they've got a way of fighting back into things where they could basically say that they've been written off. That's a great trait to have. Yeah, it's really hard to add to that. That's perfectly said. And, you know, the Three, they've had three, only three losses, three losses by eight, three, and three points. Every one of those games could have been won on the last possession of the game because of the way they were able to fight back. Two of those three games down by two touchdowns in the fourth quarter, able to come back, get one to overtime, and driving to try to tie the other one at Kansas. So, uh, you know, it's very obviously disappointing and frustrating to think uh, we're one possession away from three different games and we can be 7-0 and oh and all that. But I think it's, to me, it's positive. That I think the glass is half full when you just see – the fight that went into all that and to know that this is a team that now relishes being in a battle in the fourth quarter when the last couple of years, a lot of the fourth quarters against ACC teams, everybody's been ready to go. And this team is not ready to go when the fourth quarter comes around. They're ready to go play more. Well, and to add to that, I, I remember being part of teams in, in 2011 where we, we were good. We knew we were talented. We were fighting. Uh, arguably the best three and nine team in, yeah, in right. college football, right? And learning what to do in those critical moments. So you've got the fight, you've got the talent that's building, the, the mindset, all of those things are right. There does get to be a point of execution. And Coach Elko talked about that with the media earlier in the week of, okay, like now that we're in those gotta have it scenarios, 
how do we clean up our execution without feeling like we've got to do too much to where you can finish on those? It, where, that's when you really can capitalize on the traits that you've got, the, the never say die type mentality is when you're in those late game things. And often as a player, that's not something you know to do until you've experienced it. And it's part of your culture. And quite frankly, Duke was losing games by such a large margin. They, they weren't in those scenarios in the previous years. I also think it, it goes down to how Duke is in these games or how Duke is winning these games. It, it's been a little while since we've seen Duke, uh, particularly on the offensive side of the football, bullying people at the line of scrimmage. I mean, all the conversation coming into the game this past weekend was about, okay, the North Carolina defense hasn't been very good, but they've committed to stopping the run. They did it against Virginia Tech. They did it against Miami. That's what they're going to take away. 297 yards yeah. later, the Blue Devils were doing whatever they wanted to on the run game, saying, we're going to do us whatever you're going to try to do defensively. Well, and part of that is the strength of their defense is along the defensive line. I, I thought for sure when you watch the tape, like th this is where they're really solid. And despite that fact, yeah, Duke is imposing their will along the line of scrimmage. Arguably the biggest test of the year against Miami coming up, but um, certainly a, a beautiful sight to see. And not just the rushing. When, when you look at the way they're protecting Riley Leonard and giving him time, I thought on Saturday against North Carolina, like, that was not a, a, a major issue at all because he was able to stand back in the pocket. Sometimes I want him to get flushed because of what he does. <laughs> but um, overall, yeah, really good work. I mean, averaging – averaging 200 yards plus a game yards rushing uh that's that's pretty solid football that's winning football averaging over five yards a carry uh your quarterback coming up with 100 yard rushing games i mean they've been doing a lot in the rushing game and obviously it wasn't just the north carolina game but i think to me the best part about the north carolina game and the running aspect of it was that it enabled them to dominate the clock i mean they had possession for over 35 minutes in that game and it's something they wanted to do to keep North Carolina's high-profile offense off the field. And they were able to do that because they were able to run the ball so well. So it not only is it shows their physicality, but it's, a, to me, a key point in being able to execute the game plan that you want to execute. And it does tails in, dovetails, I should say, into the game this weekend. And you're talking about this, Dave. You look at Miami in the defensive line and what they've done to teams. 41 tackles for loss or 42, I think it is. 21 sacks. They get after people up front. Uh, they had lost three in a row before they went to Blacksburg. The final score somewhat deceiving, 20 to 14, because it was 20 to nothing going into the fourth quarter, and Virginia Tech could do nothing offensively against this Miami defense. They are big, they're strong, they're physical, they're athletic. As you would expect from a Miami team, it is going to be an awfully big challenge this weekend. How many times have we heard this about Miami? I mean, go back to the, the game, Deion Jackson, opening play of the game, rips a touchdown down there. Um, that defense coming in had, was, I think, like leading the nation or at least top five in TFLs. This is what Miami is. That they, they are a stout defensive program. They've always got, I used to call them war daddies, along the defensive line. Just big guys that can move and can beat you with power and speed. And that's, that's just kind of their MO. And uh, for Duke, you now – expect that you know that going into it a big part of it is having some versatility in the run game and I was going to expand on your point John you know I think Duke is averaging and, and hitting all these different statistics from a rushing standpoint and it's not just with the same play over and over or one or two varieties of the run game you see teams they, they get to be really fixated on the inside zone run or this is a team that wants to stretch you out sideline to sideline duke does it all they've got the pin and pull they've got power counter all these different running schemes and blocking techniques that they can use at their advantage. I think if the coaches were, were on this podcast, they'd tell you they were a little late to adjust to some of North Carolina's halftime adjustments out of the locker room. But when you saw one or two drives get them a chance to see what North Carolina had done, they had an answer in in the playbook and they started to attack the outside a little bit more um, some more pull plays and that's where you saw the running backs getting an opportunity to to have some vision to make a cut and so on Saturday against Miami that is going to be important and seeing how is Miami attacking 
using their spacing, using what they try to do and, and getting up the field against them because there are schematic things that you can do. And it's really important getting any one of these backs that the Blue Devils have. Now they've got four different players with over 250 yards rushing, and that's without breaking into you know, Terry Moore and some of these younger backs that have been called on. Give them an opportunity to make one cut. That's, that's all you need. The, the penetration kills a run play. You just need enough, though, to where they can have vision one way cut back. We saw that against North Carolina on Saturday night numerous times. Clogged up inside because the defense did what they were supposed to do, bounce it out to, to the outside, and you've got an opportunity to run. It has been pretty impressive that they have done it with four different running backs back there. They're Jalen Coleman leading rusher after the first couple games, hasn't even played the last two games, and he's listed as day-to-day -day for this week. Hope he's going to be able to play against Miami. Don't know that, but they've been able to do it without him, who is pretty fast and pretty physical, kind of got the combination of both, without him even being in there the last two games. And Jacquez Moore steps up, and uh, he's got a lightning-quick first step as he tries to make some of those cuts you're talking about. So different guys have been able to do it. It's not just relying on one running back or one type of play that you're talking about. Yeah, I, I think bottling up. like That's what Deion Jackson – capitalized on in that big run ended up being that I mean that changed the game that Blue Devils win that one because of that play and the defense is all condensed because they are creating havoc it's about giving the backs an opportunity to use their vision and to break away you mentioned the injury to Jalen Coleman see if he can get back this weekend for Miami injuries have been a huge part of the storyline for them uh, even the game against Virginia Tech I think Mallory went out with an injury the talented tight end they think they're going to have him back, but who knows, a bunch of other guys kind of on the mend. Uh, for Mario Cristobal in his first season, we mentioned the three-game losing streak. It's kind of been a, an interesting adjustment uh, for Tyler Van Dyke with this new coaching staff. The quarterback that was so good last year in the second half of the season really struggled out of the shoot, in particular that game against Middle Tennessee State where he ultimately got pulled. They come out of the open day. And he's back. I mean, nearly oh. 500 yards passing against North Carolina. Oh, you know, another big day uh, against Virginia Tech. We mentioned he loves the, the tight end uh, in the passing game. But, John, here's a guy. This is one of the few times this year Duke is going to face a quarterback who isn't a huge running quarterback. Uh, he doesn't need to, though. He can throw it all over the place. True. Second week in a row with facing, though, probably the two best passing teams in the ACC after North Carolina and now Miami as well. You know, 847 yards for Van Dyke the last two weeks, just in two weeks with five touchdowns. And they, they've just thrown the ball all over the place. They've thrown over 100 passes in those two games. They've only run it like 40 times or 50 times. So, you know, two to one is your – Pass to run ratio, and uh, so I think the Duke, Duke defense certainly has to be prepared for that. But uh, it's going to be, I think, a, they're going to try to go with the big air show, and it's uh, up to the Duke secondary to handle that as well as the pressure they, they try to get on him. Yeah, I think pressure is a big thing. Uh, there are opportunities, plain and simple, along the, the line of scrimmage for Duke to get some, some people into the backfield. Uh, I think the Blue Devils had a really nice blend on Saturday against North Carolina with – bringing pressure from some unexpected places, um, overloading one side of the line of scrimmage. In doing that, you do become susceptible to one-on-one -on -one throws and some separation down the field, but in getting some of that pressure home, um, it's, it's interesting. I put you know, TVD to, uh, right up there with Brennan Armstrong, where you've got a quarterback that had a ton of hype coming into the year, backed up by tape, from a season ago and then you have a new coaching staff come in and it it takes a little time and initially people are like oh was was van dyke overhyped coming into the year and you're, you're just seeing the chemistry start to build at a bad time for the blue devils but the, they're just kind of catching their stride they have been challenged with some of these uh, injuries overall though he's seeing the field better uh, I think he's got more confidence in his arm. He and coming off of a win is going to matter. So Duke's got to find a way to disrupt him. That that's the number one thing. Their receivers can run. And first, second, third, fourth team doesn't matter. All those guys um, are are very fluid in the open field. I think a big part of this game is going to come down to can Jamion Franklin, can Dwayne Carter the guys on the edge really step up and provide a pass rush with four or maybe blitzing one or, or two off the edge. I also think a big part of the storyline, and I might lean on the Florida boy here, is going to be <laughs> uh, John mentioned ball control earlier, running the football, time of possession, things like that. 
the way that stadium is set up, the home sideline, you'd expect them to do this way, is pretty much in shade once you get past noon. This game's going to kick at 1230. Not the same story in the visitor sideline. Not going to be as hot as it can be in early September. I think it's supposed to be in the low 80s, but it's going to be thick. That's a part of the deal in going down to Miami. And here in Durham this week, you're going to get a taste of winter. Temperature's supposed to be in the 50s in the middle portion of the week. So, Dave, what is that adjustment like when you go down there and all of a sudden it's hot and humid and, and you're trying to, trying to stay hydrated, but it'll test your depth. It'll test a lot of things playing in the heat and humidity. Yeah, I always liked it. I, I thought I played better in the heat. You you feel more warmed up. You feel like your body is more mobile. I remember trying to get warmed up to play up at Virginia Tech and just, like my knees wouldn't move appropriately <laughs> and um, going down to Florida and maybe it's because I'm from down there just felt like more like what you practice all summer and and I think from a uh, conditioning standpoint there, there's nothing to give me concern about where this Duke team is going to be regardless of of what the the temperature is I think they've done a fantastic job of putting the work in and maintaining that work where the the weather probably won't make a factor. You've got to stay on top of it, but I, I don't see that being a big deal in the game. First time being back in that stadium in a while since that Deion Jackson game because of that one year with the pandemic, Duke didn't go down there. Miami's played in Durham three years in a row. Now the Blue Devils go back there. They've already had a Super Bowl and a college football national championship game at that stadium since Duke's been there last. So it would be exciting to go back there just to be in the pro stadium and see how things go in Miami uh, in that whole atmosphere against this uh, really athletic Miami team. I I thought the, the playing surface down there outside of what you get on Brooks Field is the best in the conference just because it's it's the way it should be. It's grass. Um, it's cut nice and tight. You don't have to worry about the rye and the field is really flat. It's, it's a good place to play. And, uh, I think this is a great opportunity, a huge challenge. But when you look at the strengths of both of these teams, you've got a very strong defense in Miami going against an offense and blue devils. We've talked about their rushing attack that, and, and just the play of Riley Leonard all together that is executing at a high level so kind of the clash of the strengths and um what's gonna happen I, I think duke's hunger is going to be a big difference in the game and whether they're coming out with a victory or not you mentioned the playing surface uh, i remember it held up well last time but also remember uh, there's no rain in the forecast for saturday but i'm pretty sure when duke played there last time there wasn't any rain in the forecast and it ended up being a monsoon yeah pack a <laughs> raincoat <laughs> yeah, i remember that i remember that very well yeah. uh, but we were dry be, oh, that's very comfortable <laughs> in the booth uh Sorry, John. That's a, it was fine. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was crazy. It was like it, looking on the radar oh. where just one cloud sitting on top of the stadium. Um, it opened up. <laughs> got to do what you got to do. Oh, I just remember Ben Humphreys jumping through all those puddles, though, to come up with those fumbles that helped Duke win that game. It was an unbelievable win for Duke that time and an, and an unbelievable weather setting. Yeah. See if they can make it two in a row at Miami. 1230 kickoff this weekend. We'll see you down there. Our coverage on the radio will get underway at 1130. Thanks, fellas. Thank you. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week.